the, one of the questions you discuss is like, can the action of grace actually be dramatized? That's like not an inconsiderable problem for a Catholic writer. Right. Yeah. And, you know, the, this is, of course, indebted to Flannery O'Connor, who famously said that all my stories are about the action of grace on characters who are not very willing to support it. And, I, you know, isn't that a, an apt sort of pithy depiction of a lot of our lives, right? I mean, you don't want to sort of overemphasize our lack of willingness to support it because God willing, we grow in our, in our willingness to cooperate with grace. Uh, but we can certainly look at our lives and say, yeah, I can see that God's grace was clearly trying to convert me here and I was not very willing to support it. And she, you know, is, is excellent in her representation of that drama and that struggle um, but yeah, I mean, there are, there, are, there are other authors who say, you know, we, we should sort of eliminate, you know, our attempts to name the divine, right? This is sort of comes out of the whole apophatic tradition uh, of theology and philosophy. You know, there are certain things that are just so uh, eternal and immaterial, invisible, that we just shouldn't touch them, right? In, in a kind of supposed humility. Um, but I argue that you know, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of the representation of grace in a story, you're not doing the same thing that you would be doing if you were pointing to, let's say, particular happenings in your own life or in the life of your nation or in world history, and you were saying, "This is the hand of God," <laughs> you know, and I know definitively that this is the hand of God and nothing else. Uh, you know, that is a sort of overstatement. And uh, there's a kind of pride, Joseph Pieper says, that comes from that kind of uh, uh, bombastic claim. Um, but as Aristotle says in the Poetics, you know, it's the nature of poetry and of drama, and I would say by extension of fiction, to not represent sort of historical happenings, but to imagine what something would be like under particular conditions or circumstances, if that makes sense. So it's like what the Catholic imagination does is say, all right, look, this is the kind of character we're dealing with. In Flannery O'Connor's story, The Artificial Nigger, right? That is Mr. Head. And as you can imagine by his name, he's an overly cranial kind of guy, right? He spends a lot of time in his head. And so what God's grace is going to operate on him you would say, well, how is that going to happen? Is it going to operate immediately on his heart? Probably not. It's going to operate on his head because that's the sort of part of himself that needs the most divine physician, right? That needs the most help from the divine physician. And so that's how Fun kind of represents it at the end of that story is that grace, if it was going to operate on a kind of person like Mr. Head, it would look something like this. And I think that that's plausible and it's totally within our rights. Uh, so to speak, to do that without being sort of overly bold or prideful in saying, we know for sure how God works in every particular situation. And if I could just say one more thing, this reminds me of actually the sort of the Ignatian approach, right? On the one hand, you have the Carmelite disposition towards the imagination. If you read St. John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, you know, at the highest stages of the mystical life, you have to detach yourself from the imagination because she says, Teresa of Avila, even if it is God who's giving us, giving you this image, you don't know that it is. So you just sort of ignore it entirely, right? That's, and you, you're sort of totally stripping yourself down in order to what? Not just for its own sake, but to clear the way for union with God, right? But that's not the only way that union can happen. Union can also happen through metaphor. What does a metaphor do, right? It combines two things that are not like one another in certain ways, but are, are like one another in other ways. And the Ignatian approach to re representing God, you know, if you, if, you, if you conduct the exercises, you're invited to really meditate imaginatively on every single gospel scene that you're passing through. It's not enough to just sort of get the moral of the story or hear the Beatitudes, right? You have to sort of hear the ruffling of the fish and the bread as it's being passed around from hand to hand, right? You have to hear 
the sound that the tail of the cow is making next to Christ as Christ is born, you know, and, you know, you know, an overly literal or historical person would say, well, but, but we don't know what, what that was like. Right. So we should not, we, we're going to get it wrong in our imagination. And, and Ignatius, his response would be something like, well, you're not going to get it perfectly, but it's better to imagine it and to get yourself closer through that imagining because that imagination then will bring you into a greater union with God, right? Just from a different way, but just it's the same goal as that Carmelite imagination, which hopes to also unify us with God through a kind of you know, asceticism.